go. Okay, so Hannah Miedema, we're here to check out your Rails of Timor. Uh, this is a casual game pitch. And uh, like I've just addressed with my students here, we're going to try to understand it from the industry perspective and also from your audience perspective. So if you could tell us, first of all, um, who your audience is. Yeah, so my audience, I'm thinking at least for sure, like ages 13 and up, just because like, it's not necessarily like full on like horror, but like, it's just kind of a creepier game that's like, it would be unsettling to like younger kids. So I want it mainly to be enjoyable to like any adult age, but like definitely like 13 and up. It's not like it's like heavily mature or anything like that, just because I don't want to unsettle young kids. <laughs> But um, so the premise of my game is that it is a mystery platformer where you are finding clues to advance through this like crazy mind bending train that you just kind of woke up on as this character um, and you're finding yeah clues to figure out why you're here, who brought you here and how you get off. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of a puzzle platformer um, where you kind of navigate through different train cars that are different levels. Um, and then in those, there's like hidden areas where you can like find clues and stuff like that, that unlock the next level. And as you progress, each level will get harder and harder and like more almost like busy with different like platforms and enemies and that kind of thing. So this is like my full game marketing image that shows just kind of like what the app icon would be, what it looks like in um, mobile view for phone and for the iPad Pro, just so you kind of see like general how it would look on any kind of tablet or phone. Um, and it just kind of showcases um, kind of one of the beginner levels and what it would look like and kind of shows the vibe of just kind of how creepy it can be, I guess. Um, but then like, as I move on, this just kind of shows you how to in interact with like the menu for this game. So you would click on that notebook and it would open up to your main menu where you can save, um, quit the game to your phone, um, different like options for like sound levels. There's a leaderboard section for like different scores of people who beat each level. And then linking out to social media as well as like your inventory, your levels and your collectibles. Um, and then you could also click on that exclamation point, which would take you to your clues page in your notebook. That kind of goes through your progress of the game. When you find clues, what they say will go into here and you can scroll and see older clues and kind of figure out the story of the game if you don't like remember it as you're playing. Um, and then you can exit out to that back to the main game. And that's just kind of uh, what it would look like. Um, the going from there is started with different kind of concepts of like what the environment, what kind of feel I wanted to give. Um, and I think I managed to get that in my end images. And so I'm pretty happy with where I ended up. And I think it kind of started here where I was just kind of any idea of like trains and how I wanted the vibe to be rather than like some classy train car I wanted to be almost more beat up and run down and like abandoned um so this just kind of goes over the different things that I was thinking of what I would need different characters the different levels um yeah and then the props and things like that so one of my biggest benchmarks um, for kind of every aspect of the game, just for like the overall feel is A Hat in Time by Gears for Breakfast, specifically their marketing image. Um, they have one level where you are on a train and they're a 3D platformer, um, but I like this art for them and just how they have, it's not as creepy as like my game, but they've just got this like air of mystery throughout this whole level that I really enjoyed. And then the simplicity of their characters. Um, another game that I really wanted to kind of 
benchmark off of is Limbo, which is just, it's got a lot of like dramatic scenes that really kind of focus on like your actions. Um, and so is that just like contrast in that game is what I wanted. And then Little Nightmares, again, it's a 3D game, but I just really liked, again, you have kind of a simplistic, cute looking character in a weird and very like off-putting atmosphere, which I wanted to capture with my game. So here I just have like all my benchmarks for the logo, kind of different environment to show how I wanted lighting and contrast, props, how I wanted, again, some parts of them to be kind of chunky, just to work well with mobile. Um, and then character benchmarks to show both the character you play as and the main villain. And then some of the GUI benchmarks just to kind of show what I was looking for for the overall um, interactive elements of it. So this just kind of shows the in progress of logo, starting from just kind of three different sketches, um, which kind of turned into a more determined design of the train with the kind of melting letters of Timor. And from there, kind of did three different color varieties and it ended up, ended up going with the um, kind of rusted color with the blue lettering, just because I feel like that kind of went with my overall um, atmosphere of the game as well. And I kind of went with that and pushed it really further. Um, I wanted to make it look like it was tarnished metal that had this like glowing eeriness around it. And then I really wanted to focus on, as I pushed it towards my final logo, the light effects um, and just the different ways that like it interacted with like that metal. Moving on to the environment, I did a couple different train cars for the thumbnails, different like dining cars, sleeping cars, kind of just different ones that would either be like normal or like as you progress, progress more in the game, more distorted. Um, and then I moved on to the grayscale or just like the monotone drawings. And I did one of the dining car in the engine room, the engine car. Um, and then moving forward, I just moved forward with the dining car. Um, and I started with kind of more like warmer tones um, and just ended up actually with cooler tones because it created more of a contrast and more of an eeriness that I wanted. Um, and then I also have just like a test of like what an animation would look like in the game with like flickering lights and movement to kind of show the unsettling like broken down train car. Then with character silhouettes, um, I did two different characters, the detective, which is the character you play as, and the conductor, which is the main kind of villain or the monster of, of my game. Um, and I just wanted to show like with the conductor, like in the earlier levels of the game, you might look more humanoid, but then as the game gets harder, he gets more monstrous. And I really liked the idea of that kind of transition. Um, for the detective, I wanted to go with a simplified shape that was kind of ambiguous that everybody could kind of relate to. Um, and then I liked the bright color with like a patterned coat to help him kind of pop out in the environment compared to the other like characters. The monster, kind of the opposite of the detective, I wanted him to be kind of complex, creepy, always kind of moving, lots of limbs, and just kind of color-wise almost blend in with the environment because he's using that to his advantage to like sneak up on the main character. And then for the assets, um, I wanted to create like a notebook for the menu, um, different like level up of the detective's lamp, rat swarms, because that will be part of the main um, the conductors like attack um, and just different things that you'd find in like a broken down and like abandoned train. So like dead rats and trash and <laughs> different things like that. Um, and then kind of looking at what this um, notebook icon would look like when it's 
part of like the GUI and then when you open it up to see just the actual menu inside and then comparing that to one of my benchmarks and I really tried to match that and I think that I accomplished that well and then also the um the lamp to show like right where you get it um right away in the game and then how it levels up and levels up again um just to show yeah how it lights up your environment which is kind of a key aspect of the game So working with the GUI, I wanted it to be kind of simple just because it is a mobile game. So I wanted it to be there, but not take over the environment because that is kind of the star of, of the show. So you've got your health bar and then you've got a light meter for your lamp, the notebook to click to the menu, um, a counter for those different like floating memory orbs that you see within the environment. Um, and then the buttons are for left and right to move the character and then a jump and then a lamp button to use your lamp and interact with it. And I wanted to compare kind of the full view with that with um, just an accessibility view for people with color blindness. And I think that it's still kind of pops and you can still see like contrast, which is another big part of like my overall look. Um, and finally for monetization, um, It'd be kind of a both free to play or you could buy it so that way you know if you want to test out the game it's free to play but there would be ads based on like how much time you spent on the game or in between each of the levels um, but then if you really enjoyed the game and you didn't want to have to deal with ads you could make a one-time payment for the premium version and still um, enjoy the game but not be interrupted with it um, and that is my presentation for Rails of Tomorrow. Um, there's images, more images and stuff on my website and on my Instagram, so you can check that out. But yeah, I'm excited for any feedback or comments. Wow, Hannah, thank you so much for showing the Rails of Timor. Um, could you take us back to, I think, uh, the first page where you have uh, all of the um, everything inside of the iPads or, and the phone. So the first time you show us that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll take, this is, this is what I wanted to look at. Right. Well, fantastic. Um, you have a very precise presentation and I got a good sense of the game. I'd like to have an, a better understanding of how he uses the light. So the detective moves through the space. And I said he, but it feels like it could be genderless really actually um yeah that was kind of my goal yeah yeah so how does light affect the uh monster what happens when the light spreads does that light circle have to hit the monster um what can you tell us a little bit more about that part yeah so there's a aspect of the game where like the monster is not always present but there will be times especially like in the earlier levels before you fight the final boss where like all of a sudden like the lights will shut off in the lamp menu and the only way to like navigate and jump to different platforms is by your lantern so then like the screen would be like either like really dark and then like the circle of light would like show the different objects um and then also like i'm thinking he has like a pocket knife or like a pen knife as a weapon but i was also thinking that like using the lamp as like almost like a mace or like a club like you just swing it around and then as you like attach it to that pole it would become a two-handed weapon um yeah i saw that could you go to that that weapons or like where you describe those assets so i see that he can hold it with two hands or they can hold it with two hands i think this is where so on level three Gives mm -hmm. off a larger circle of light, can light up high places, possibly use as a two-handed mace. So uh, how would that function? The, the lantern would be hitting things too, not just shining lights on it? Yeah, uh, that's what I was leaning towards. It was kind of an idea that came like later on, um, just because I feel like just having like a simple like pen knife as one weapon without anything else might be 
a little lacking. So I thought like, oh, maybe you could turn that into a two-handed weapon where you like full baseball, like bat swing it at something and then it like use it as a tack because it is like a magical lantern. So it's not like it's going to shatter. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it won't be shattering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Michaela, um, I'm wondering if you could talk about how, what you think about the storyline of the detective versus the monster uh, and, and all of his rat kingdom <laughs> and, and what you think about how that fits with, with the audience that Hannah is aiming at. Uh, I think it works really well. I mean, I'm interested. Like, I want this to be a game. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I remember mentioning before, and you said it was part of your benchmarks, that it gives me, like, big Little Nightmares vibes. So just, like, this little character going through this much larger world with all these larger creatures is just, I think it's so cool. I think it fits together really well. I like the themes of, like, <clears throat> light and darkness. Um, I just, yeah, I think this is all super awesome. I love it. Yeah, I think you mentioned there, Michaela, uh, little versus big, right? Is that mm -hmm. part of what you're trying to do, Hannah, where um, someone would gain self-confidence uh, through the game? Yeah, I wanted the character to be, like, relatable. So, like, I tried to do genderless, um, just so, like, anybody can relate to it, kind of ambiguous. But also, yeah, like, they're bright, and they're in kind of this monotone, like, dark world. Like, it's about, like... And then I know like not every situation is like light and dark, but it's just, it is supposed to be like, you relate to the character as and like, you are taking charge kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So Hannah, could you explain to us again, the idea of collecting objects, maybe go to a slide that talks about that. And China, if you could talk with us about how you think that functions in the game and do you think it works for um, the game functioning. Oh, uh, which part fo uh, functions? So are? a part of what the detective does, I think, Hannah, is to go and collect um, the swirly objects, right? And maybe you need to tell us that a little bit more in, in depth and then if China could respond to if that's working. Yeah, so like there's two different things you can collect and in one of them you see kind of this counter for um, and that's these like three small things that you see in this iPad image. And those are all like basically comparable to like coins in like a Mario game where like they help you level up as a character. They can also be like tracked for like the leaderboards. Like, did you find all of them? Did you find like all the hidden objects or hidden coins? Um, and like how fast maybe you collected them. But then the like round, like spiral circle one, that's what I'm calling like your memory, like orb or piece that you were trying to collect in order to unlock and advance to the next level. So China, do you think that's functioning uh, with the yeah, story game plan? Um, and I think that it uh, gives it a lot of replayability because, you know, um, if you don't collect the ball or if there's a specific amount of time that you need to collect them in to get a better score, then everyone will want to try it again to get a better score, you know, especially since you said there's a leaderboard. So people are competitive and, you know, in our very beings, we're competitive creatures. So I think that that um, <laughs> is a good aspect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'd like to go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask a question. Is this um, each one, are, are they like separate levels? So you can just replay that one level, you know? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that works well. So we move through several train cars to move yes. through levels, right? You have mm -hmm. a, I think in your concept art, you show us where uh, one of the cars is quite creeped out, right? Could you go to yeah. that page? Yeah, like as you progress, it just gets like creepier and more, I, I don't know, disturbed, I guess is what I would mm -hmm. call it. Like on the second train car there where there's a lot of growth and, um, mm -hmm. right, scary. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the lighting and the style of the game. Wenjin, uh, are you here right now? And could you, could you respond to how you think 
Hannah has worked with her painting of the assets. Maybe Hannah, you could go to one of the more finalized imaging. And uh, do you think it works for her audience, Winjin? I think so. I think the lighting and the painting really fit to like what she was going for the game. And they looks really nice. Whoever, I like those little lighting, just, <clears throat> I mean, it's on the tree. So those lighting was kind of light on different things and light on the uh, character also. So I think that's really cool. Kind of like point out the main things you have to look at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, while we're on this one, I'm wondering about the way that Hannah is handling the, the assets, all of the graphic design elements. And Adam, if you could um, speak to, if you think it's functioning in terms of understanding how these buttons work and their positioning um, in terms of the UX design of the game. Oh, you're talking to me? Yes, oh. Adam. <laughs> Um, I mean, with the whole mock-up design, it looks really well done. Um, you can clearly tell what each functionality is supposed to be at a quick glance. Um, even like the buttons, uh, you can, they're, um, simplified so that the player can actually get a better sense of what each, uh, functionality buttons do, which is really well done. Uh, the health bar system and the light meter are easily seen and easily readable, uh, even at this mock-up design that you have up here. Um, the only thing I would probably say is, um, where is it? Um, the two buttons to the right, um, you do have a little bit of room where you could enlarge those a little bit. Are you saying the bottom right, the buttons? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the yeah the bottom right because mm -hmm. the thing about um, design about buttons is that the more detail you put into them, the smaller it goes. It's harder to actually really tell what they are. Um, so maybe enlarging them a little bit um, so that people can tell um, just by looking at it. Because when you're playing a game, especially like this, that you kind of um, when you're learning the game itself. The buttons are there for the icons to tell you which it is so that you have a muscle memory of it. And that way, so that when people are just still learning the game, they can easily tell without really like screwing up <laughs> their, um, I guess, fulfillment enjoyment of the game. <laughs> so that's the only technical thing I have with the buttons. Just make the bottom right just a tiny bit bigger. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, Hannah, could you take us to the accessible design portion of your slides? And I would like Anna to respond to how that's functioning. One of the things that we try to do in this course is to try to understand if it's working for uh, the visually impaired. And so we've got this colorblind feature. So um, Anna, what do you think? Does it function uh, for all players? I think it does quite well, especially because the main character is still that super bright, contrasty color of, of the bright yellow, even in the colorblind version. And they really catch your eye because it looks like it's like the only kind of color on the page. And then the monster, I think, almost even works even better because it's it's blending in more to the background, which makes it kind of like even harder to see, even spookier. But it still has those super bright spots that really pop it out and catch your eye. I think it looks great. Yeah, I'm really pleased that you still have a lot of the hierarchy that you you had planned, Hannah. Well, I'm a little surprised that the buttons on the right, the jump and the light buttons don't maintain their hierarchy. I'm wondering if they're almost too green and not blue enough to do that. Mm. What okay. do you think, yeah. Hannah, about how that functions there? Yeah, I was... Um... They look like, yeah, pretty gray right now compared to like blue, but um, I like, I still think that they're visible, but I think they almost look like on the same plane as like the the track that mm -hmm. you see, like the wheels or whatever, rather than like they do in the colored version where they're clearly in front. So I think that's something that could be worked on, but they still are like visible to me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm wondering if, um, 
adding the circle that's around the move buttons on the left, uh, instead of it just being kind of a softer edge, might function better. What do you think about that? Adam, what do you think about that? Sorry, repeat what you were saying. <laughs> well, Anna, did you hear me? Maybe you can respond to it. Yeah, uh, you were talking about like the buttons and their uh, contrast. Sorry, <laughs> my nieces are over and I, I just completely <laughs> lost my focus. Yeah, I'm wondering um, about the buttons uh, in, in terms of the successful design piece. You know how we have these on the left, they have circles around them. So if we had circles around these, uh, not with mm -hmm. yellow, but with the whitish, if that mm -hmm. might function a little bit better, I'm using my mouse instead of my finger. So it's not functioning quite so well, but that, that would make it stand out a little bit. Yeah. More. I also think they feel a little bit disconnected right mm -hmm. now to me. I think having a border would really help pull them off of that background kind of plane, like really make them stand out to say, this is not part of that like mm -hmm. the other buttons. Mm -hmm. The other thing I did notice is the monster's health bar in the colorblind version is like really hard to see. Uh, so I don't know if like that would turn to white as it goes down or or if you played with that or whatnot. Yeah, so since it's full right now, it, like it does really blend in, but I have a feeling yeah. that, like as it empties, it'll be like white where like it's empty and seeing mm -hmm. how much like the white right now sticks yeah, out. So feeling if there's like white on the on one edge like maybe yeah. in the presentation you need to show us um the line of it but since it's pretty much full red if you pushed it more towards yellow it, it in terms of like a orangish color it might function a little bit better also maybe trying to uh lighten up in terms of its color because it does look like a darker red so mm -hmm. maybe lighting up would um push it back out a little bit more so that it's not so blending in that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Hannah, I think you have done a fantastic job on your presentation. Um, one of the things that um, that we can know about the way you, you handled your presentation is there was a lot of assignments in the class, but you took and made a copy of the presentation and made it more, um, more ready as a pitch. So I really congratulate you on, on doing that. Really fantastic job. Um, Adam, you had some comments that you wanted to make about the way that it's presented. Um, so if you could use some of your graphic design knowledge to help us on that. Yeah, um, go back to the um, slide that you had uh, with like your uh, app design and the screens. This one? Yes. Or the next view? No, that one. Um, this looks really well done. Um, um, the way that you have your type, especially with the description, is really nice. The only thing is to get rid of that tab in the first sentence. Uh, it looks really off. Um, just left justify the whole paragraph. Yeah, just left justified it. It doesn't need to be tabbed. That way, so it looks a little bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. Also, um, when it comes to you switching from your iPad to the phone mockup, um, you could definitely tell that not all of the you can't see everything because it looks like it's like cutting off on the phone where its feet are um yeah the, the way that um i've seen a lot of people um manage between different devices is that um they keep the same aspect ratio but um have it to where there's like bars on the side um because not every phone is going to be the same dimensions and um, the way they work around that is to keep it one specific ratio. And then as it goes through different devices, then they start um, adding um, the blank space, which is like a solid color. That way, so that you're not enlarging it and you're missing out a bunch of key details that you're, the player definitely needs to see as they're playing the game. Well, yeah. are we missing anything, Hannah? Is there like garbage or things that we need to pick up? Things that we need to, I see the rats are, are brought up. We're, we're missing his toes, but are we missing anything that we actually need to functionally do? Um, the most that you're missing is just kind of like the train like exterior that you see like an iPad at the top and the bottom. Um, and I kind of made those so that you could cut them out for like a mobile view. 
Um, but then my intention was also that like, when you played, it'd almost be like, I don't know if parallax is the right word, but like, so when you jumped up, your view kind of goes up too. So that, um, cause like you can see like in the phone view, like that top like little memory coin in the middle is like a little bit cut off. But like if your character was to like jump on top of the cable, the whole view would kind of shift up. And so you would see like the rest of this, like the top of the train car. That and definitely makes sense, but you definitely need to have a fixed point um, so that as the player just even just walking around, there's a fixed point. Because again, it looks like his feet are cut off. <laughs> um, I would just say play a little bit with that. Um, go with whatever you feel is right. But it just definitely looks a little bit off looking at it from here. Mm -hmm. So just do what you can with it. That was just my only big thing on this page. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I think it, perhaps if you just don't cut his feet off, that might be one way. I'm yeah, not, yeah, I'm not super bothered by it. I I like the idea of you you having it having the um, accelerometer built into it. Uh, I think that you should talk about that in your pitch then mm -hmm. so that we can we can see it so um i do have one more mm -hmm. um go back to the slide where you're explaining the different levels of the lantern oh not this one probably the slide that's more finished yeah for that one yeah um my only issue is where you're talking about the different levels. Uh, it looks like the type is blending into your image pretty bad, uh, especially when you have more like on the level three. Um, the easiest way to get through that is to have a um, gradient going from the uh, right edge and then trailing off as you get closer to the character so that your type isn't look like it's like blending into your image. Mm -hmm. but that's yeah. the only big thing no, i agree um, i think that that's hard to read um and i'd also like for you to um credit this benchmark whoever had made that um mm -hmm. you have done a fantastic job of matching all your benchmarks i think and i think that this is ready to do as a pitch are you looking to um you know put in your portfolio and try to pitch it to different companies or just have it as a representation so that you could work for a game company what's your ideas for the future of the rails of Timor. I mean, shoot, I would love, like, love, love, love if this could be like an actual game. Like, I just like want to play a game like this so bad, and so I, don't, <laughs> I just have to like make this stuff for it because I just love this kind of stuff. Um, well, you could uh, work. Through, we talked about continuing um, the project. You could turn it into an interactive piece. Uh, mm -hmm. I showed you those frameworks. You could work with Chris Brown on some of the, the development of it. Yeah, I would love to play the Rails of Timor. Yeah, it's just like, that's pretty daunting. To <laughs> <laughs> well, and but also though, as a concept artist, um, you have this in your, in your um, production work and now you can show that you can do this kind of thing and now on to the next thing. I mean, that's the other way of going, so. We've had students do both, where they continue pushing, um, they work on different animations for this kind of thing. Or the other option is to, you know, start another project to show that you could do something um, cute with fairies and mushrooms or something. Or a pizza parlor that is uh, trying to fight off warriors in the night or something. I don't know. Figure out what what is the next thing for Hannah and it'll be awesome. <laughs> well, I thank you, want... Hannah. Oh, yeah. round of applause. <laughs> is there anything any, anybody else wanted to say before we shut? Yeah, I wanted to yeah, make a comment. To um, I wanted to say that, honestly, I think that you uh, show a lot of creativity with all of this and um, the way that you draw things it just looks so professional. And um, I like the, how you showed like your process with your uh, concept sketches. And I really think that um, I could see, um, I watch a lot of YouTube, so I feel like I could totally see uh, Markiplier or Jacksepticeye playing this game. So, <laughs> and I would play it, so. 
Yeah, definitely, like, that'd be the dream right there is to make this into Right? Like- Jack playing it, and then you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, Hannah. Thank you so much. And uh, are you going to put it on ArtStation? I was working on that, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. We'll look forward to seeing it. Yeah. What Do you have an ArtStation account already? Do you go by Hannah Meadema there? I do. I, like, haven't put anything on there. Like, that was my big, like, summer project because I really just put <laughs> my website this year. So, yeah. like, it's on yeah. there. But, like, that is my next big thing. Yeah. Okay. We'll look forward to it.